Deepa. She is the one who gets us all together, extremely dynamic. Uh, you know, really wonderful to have her. She uh, keeps telling us about you, what everybody is doing, you know, <laughs> keeps us, uh, updating us. It's very, very nice, ma'am. Over here it's snowing. It's it's uh, very okay. cold. <laughs> I've, I've drawn the curtains, but actually it's really snowing outside. Okay. And, uh, you can't see it very easily. Yeah. Maybe at the end of the talk I'll show. Yeah. It's, it's been snowing since yesterday, and it's actually very beautiful when, when we have this yeah. snow. My oh. son is in Canada, so I get all the story pictures. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man, he's grown up now and he's yeah, okay. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Ma'am, we remember we remember all of you. Maitri, as you know, is in University of South Carolina now. She's a yeah. group leader there. Okay. And uh, Monica's uh, Monica is also in the US. Vaishali, of course, Vaishali is speaking tomorrow. Yeah. So I'm waiting Vaishali for Vaishali keeps visiting us, you know. She <laughs> keeps refreshing yes, us. And the good one. Yeah. She's and the good one. <laughs> I'm the very bad one. I'm going to be very naughty today in the talk and incite all the students to naughtiness. <laughs> so, Anita, are we um, waiting for more people to join? I'm, um, <clears throat> oh, she's on the phone. So, I'm, I'm waiting for the go ahead, Mudgal, ma'am, from yeah. Anita. Then, then I can start. Yeah, I know. So, Vaishali, what time in, in, is it for you in California? It's 1.15 a.m. in the night. You really, you I, really had to get up in the morning, right? <laughs> it's late, late uh, night, late night, yeah, late night. For no, Vaishali, for me. Yes. Yes. So for, tomorrow, me, for me, ma'am, it's a good time, 10.15, 10, okay. 10, 15, okay. 10 30. Okay. Okay. Right. So tomorrow, if the speaker sleeps off in between, you know, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, giving a talk at 1.30 in the morning is certainly a challenge. Yeah. It's worth taking. It's a worthy challenge, Vaishali. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. But she, she was there yesterday also, and uh, you know, great yeah. that you today. I'm, I'm oh. practicing to, to, to keep awake <laughs> during this time. So yesterday Actually, I'm very awesome. honored, Vaishali, that you, 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 wake, you stayed awake for me. I, and I hope I don't put you to bed. But if you go away to sleep, I will not, I will not hold it against you. <laughs> <laughs> you can slip away quietly if I if if and I will I pretend slip not to away quietly without <laughs> making much noise. She stayed away from me yesterday. Also, she was away. Yeah, That's amazing. I was busy making this talk at that time. Yeah, Mudgal ma'am, I've taken a lot of time to make this talk. I was very yes. surprised. Anita was also surprised. She said, Santana, why are you taking so long? And I, really I said, because... forward, yeah. <laughs> <your talk. laughs> yes, it was, I was, uh, it took me a long time for sure. Uh, we are just waiting for our principal ma'am to join and then we will begin. Our guest of honor, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi K. Gupta has joined. Uh, welcome Gupta ma'am. We're just waiting, Principal Ma'am, to join. I hope that uh, she's on. Uh, she knows that she's on mute because I think when you first join, uh, you're on mute. So maybe Gupta Ma'am is on. Yeah, probably, but I can see her in the meet. Yes, now. Ma'am has unmuted herself. Hello, Anita. Hello, Santvana. Welcome. Uh, hello, Ma'am. for joining. Sorry for this link confusion. Actually, the previous link was not in YouTube. And a lot of our students are on YouTube because we got close to 700 registrations. So then oh it was not possible uh, for everyone to join on Google. So we are doing YouTube streaming for them. No, no, it's OK. Actually, I'm looking forward to listening to Santvana because she says she had been prepared, preparing quite uh, hard. Uh, you know. So yeah. let's look forward to her uh, presentation. Yeah, we're just waiting for principal ma'am to, to be there. Yes, done. now I'm getting very nervous, Gupta ma'am, when she sings 700 <laughs> participants. No, no. I don't know. I believe my father-in-law is listening, my father and my mother, my friends yeah. from Cambridge University, because I shared this link. So okay. I have to be very careful what I say. <laughs> uh, sure. All of us will be proud of you, I'm very sure. Thank you, ma'am. I hope you have shared the new link or the YouTube link. Oh, I shared the old link. Oh, the good. Let me while we're waiting for um for the uh, others, uh, I will just quickly while we're waiting for her to join, I can. I, send I, this. On our group, I have already messaged the new link, 
ensure that you are sending that to all your near and dear ones who want to join or the youtube link Principal ma'am, uh, because the new link ma'am is joining, so it's just maybe few minutes. I think Anita, more people are trying to be let in. Okay, now they're in. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, um, my cabinet will take care. <laughs> I have all my friends there, so WDC cabinet ma'am has given me an excellent team, so they'll take care. Actually, we, we became very choosy with respect to Google because uh, if we get all the students and then guests have to join, so how to get them in? So that's why the students were given YouTube link and the dignitaries, guest speakers, and the cabinet has been given Google link. So that's why. And I just see Sarita Nanda ma'am has joined. Uh, you'll be happy to know. You must have seen the poster. Ma'am is vice principal also now. Nanda ma'am. Yes, I saw. It's wonderful. Congratulations, ma'am. I would I would not expect anything less. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have been I have been following your uh, you know life uh, throughout uh, we are part of we are Facebook friends, no? So you are always <laughs> in front of me and your uh, it's uh, good that you have come to, you know, uh, give your uh, views on women and things to our uh, youngsters. It's great, great to have you back with us. Thank you, Nanda, ma'am. Uh, I, I asked Mudgal, ma'am, also for her blessings and you also, ma'am. We will be uh, your blessings, your good wishes, your your education is what has got us this far. So everything that we've achieved, uh, Nanda ma'am, is thanks to you. I remember how much you supported me before I, uh, as I was progressing in my career with recommendation letters, with um, uh, all kinds of advice. It's it's just absolutely very, very moving to see you again in person. And I was, I'm wondering why I left it for so long. So I'm just waiting for this COVID situation to resolve and then to come back to Delhi and, uh, see Anita and see all of you again. Good, good. Welcome, welcome. Ma'am has joined. Uh, Principal Ma'am has joined. All right. Uh, students, we can go live. We have Principal Ma'am. Uh, YouTube people, uh, we can also do the live streaming on. Good afternoon to all. In the words of Albert Einstein, the woman who follows the crowd will usually go no further than the crowd. The woman who walks alone is likely to find herself in places no one has ever been before. Good afternoon to one and all. We are elated to welcome you to the international webinar series of the Women's Development Cell of Torah Ram College under the ages of IQAC. The overarching theme for this webinar series, spanning over three days, is Women and Career in Science, Opportunities, Challenges, and the Way Ahead. I, Devan Shivats. And I, Bhavya Pandey. 
Welcome our audience and thank you all for gracing us with your presence this afternoon. Now, I would like to request Dr. Anita Garg Mangla, convener, Women's Development Cell, to give the welcome address. Thank you, Devanshu. Good afternoon to one and all present. I, Dr. Anita Garg Mangla, Assistant Professor and convener, Women's Development Cell, Dollar College, takes immense pleasure in welcoming our guest of honor, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi K. Gupta, speaker for the day, Dr. Santana Kaur, Respected Principal Ma'am, Dr. Savita Roy, Vice Principal Ma'am, Dr. Sarita Nanda, all the faculty members, esteemed guests, and dear students, on this second day of the three-day international webinar series on Women and Career in Science, Opportunities, Challenges, and the Way Ahead, from 6 January to 8 January 2021. Speaker for the today, is Dr. Carr, which is an alumnus from Dolakram College Biochemistry Department, 93-96 batch, and is going to share her experience from a DRCN to being as a life science strategy director at a startup in California. Her progression in career ladder to landing in dream job will incite you with how real life journey graph looks like, how you make challenges which comes your way as stepping stones towards success, and finally, restating the quote, she came, she saw, she conquered. Dear students, I'm sure after listening to her, you'll become more excited, motivated, stronger, and would leave no stone unturned to reach your goals in future and ace and shine as a GRCN. I welcome once again to this meet and due apologies for the initial technical glitch. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. We really look forward to your talk and seeing you all talking about the days that you had. It just gives me so much excitement. I would like to now begin with the felicitation ceremony. WDC DRC takes immense pleasure in extending our gratitude and regards to our guest of honor, to our principal, our respected speaker for the day, our vice principal, ma'am, convener, ma'am, all the other dignitaries, faculty members, and students for joining us today. And they accept this token of her respect and appreciation. I would like to call upon Dr. Anita Garg Mangla to present this virtual bouquet to our speaker for today, Dr. Santhana Karnam. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Before we begin with the program, WDC DRC would like to present to you a few glimpses of the various programs and activities undertaken under the cell throughout the year.
Now, we would request Dr. Sarita Nanda Ma'am, Associate Professor and Teacher in Charge, Biochemistry Department, to kindly address the gathering. Sarita ma'am, you kindly unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, little trouble in getting it unmuted. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, this is a session which had st started uh, yesterday with a very um, good, uh, uh, you know, uh, speakers uh, giving their thoughts about the challenges in career, uh, which the women should know. So this is what I would go ahead with it uh, to bring in this, uh, you know, point forward that uh, we do, uh, women today are progressing and they like to take up a uh, career, but uh, still this area is new to women, to our gender, and we are still learning to how to come up uh, nicely and without any trouble to the pinnacle of uh, the career. It is, uh, we don't have mothers to guide us through this journey. Initially, our mothers used to tell us everything right from, uh, you know, uh, child to elder age, they could guide us because they had lived that sort of a life. But uh, today, the life we have chosen, they have never lived. And uh, it's, it's, it is different from like uh, what men face and what women face. There is because there is a gender difference. There is a difference in uh, our, um, you know, emotional skills. There is a difference in, uh, you know, physical, uh, uh, you know, endurement. There is, uh, you know, we, uh, and then uh, uh, you, as we all know that women have to have the burden of bringing up children also. And then we love to, you know, give them enough time and care. And uh, that comes at the cost of the time, you know, the time you have to divide between your career and uh, bringing up the children and then feeling emotionally satisfied with it. So there is uh, something like, you know, uh, it is not only your intellectual skills which are important. It is important to have lots of other skills which will uh, help you to go progress ahead. That is, one is your health, which is, which is an utmost uh, thing of importance. If you don't have good health, you will not be able to contribute either to your career or to your home. So this is, and this you can only learn by, you know, uh, learning healthy ways of life. And that healthy ways of life is not only healthy eating, it is also your emotional input. How do you balance your mind? How you manage your time? And then the priority, what you give, importance to what is important and what is not important and which, uh, you know, relationship you would like to give more time on. And, and the time is also like, if the children are growing up, of course, they need more time. And maybe there are elders and things like that. There's so many skills. And the emotional quotient is, is something which is very, very important because even if you, uh, you know, rise to the top, you are still, um, you know, the la love giver in the home. You are the one who is going to knit the family together. So uh, still that, that uh, you know, we are all very sensitive. Uh, uh, the men 
get away with many things that they don't care because uh, the women can take uh, take care of all these things. But we don't have that support. We have to, uh, you know, build up that support. But of course, things are changing and uh, more men are becoming sensitive enough to give you that sort of a helping hand. But yet it's a journey which we all have to, you know, uh, we have to make a path and make them learn also that how we we need some help and not to feel shy about it. So the, these are my, uh, you know, uh, experiences which I have put in. And uh, Santwana will give you more insight because she uh, and Santwana and this group who is much younger to us may have faced many problems which we haven't faced. And uh, so they will help you to uh, learn many things which these people have harnessed to, you know, uh, give them uh, satisfaction in their career. So uh, on to uh, the, uh, the talk. And thank you for calling me uh, for inaugurating this. Thank you. Nanda ma'am, you'll be happy to know that my whole batch, 93 to 96, is there on the meet, irrespective of the time they are. For Vaishali, it is 2 a.m. For others, because Santana okay. is waiting, so my entire batch is there. Oh, that, that's very nice, very nice. <laughs> so now, very 92, 96 biochemistry batch is there live now. Very good, very good, very good. That's the, that's the fun of the, you know, media. You know, the media has brought us together. Okay. Ma'am, I would now like to request our principal, Dr. Savita Roy, to kindly address us. Thank you, Devanshi. And yesterday was a very thought provoking session, and I hope the same will be today. And uh, uh, as uh, Anita said, they are all the all of them are the batchmates. I have got one more uh, request that the entire batch should be registered on the LMNA portal, which we are going to float now, so that you know you can contribute. We can interact with you, and our students will be able to benefit from your uh, whatever you have achieved in your uh, career. And a little bit of you know. Say smooth sailing will be there for them in case they want to, you know, uh, tread on your path or on uh, towards your profession. You will be able to guide them properly. So uh, we, all of us, are eagerly waiting for your uh, uh, session. And therefore, I think uh, without uh, taking much of our time, uh, I think Dr. Carr, you can start with your uh, 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 delivery, and uh, I will be listening to you throughout the session. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, can you hear me properly? If, uh, if there's any problem, please uh, let me know. I'm just putting my timer on. Santana, ma'am, uh, uh, can you please just uh, wait for a while because I would like to introduce you to all our participants. Sure. And yes. Ma'am, we haven't had a chance to give you a proper welcome. Kindly allow us to do that and then we, we can begin. Yes, ma'am. We would like to extend the warmest welcome to our esteemed guest for day two of our international webinar series, Dr. Santhana Kar, who was one of the 10 national recipients for the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust and British Evening Scholarship to do her PhD at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, University of Cambridge in 1999, having published two first author papers propounding a novel theory about tau protein binding to microtubules during her PhD, she continued with the postdoctoral work on cancer proteins at Wellcome Institute at University of Cambridge, UK, 2002, receiving the British Evening Scholarship for a diploma in business management at London Business School and Judge Institute of Management while moving into the pharmaceutical industry in 2004. She was also the CEO of her own life science company, making natural therapies for people with cancer. With limited or no treatment options, Dr. Carr has herself been on cancer wait and watch from 2012 to 2016, when she founded the company and exited with an out-licensing out deal. She continues to work on novel compounds for people with cancer in her current role with a Californian startup. She is an alumina of DRC's biochemistry department and will be addressing on the topic, the greatest challenges you, you will face 
after you land your dream job today thank you so much ma'am thank you enlighten us with your words i would request the participants who have joined us through both google meet and youtube link uh, to type in their queries and questions to dr kaz at press and she will take them uh, after her press thank you so much for that very gracious and wonderful um introduction and to my teachers who are here to my entire batch who is here to support me to the principal of dolathram college who has been so encouraging and um you know makes us feel a part of a community i'm really proud and extremely emotional to be here today um i actually do have tears in my eyes because um it's really really emotional to to be uh, greeted and um uh by your own batchmates by your juniors from your college by your teachers by the principal of your current of your college the current principal of your college it makes this journey seem worthwhile it makes um it makes you look back and connect the dots and somehow um things start to fall in place because if we were to move ahead in solitude it would not be worth it it is when we can find ourselves and and go somewhere to you know go into a new career into new opportunities but take other people with us that this journey becomes worthwhile so um it's i feel really um very very honored to have all of your support and to have uh, such a wonderful audience in front of me and uh, without further ado i'd like to start uh, please interrupt me if i'm not clear you know let me know um this is the first time i'm giving a talk to so many people by this uh, means of google meet i have never spoken to over 70 people or 75 people on on social media for me this is a first and it's uh, it's it tells us how our times have changed and i feel um so i i you know as i look i feel both uh, young and old uh, as i was as i was looking at the years at which i was graduating i was thinking that a lot of the audience here were not born at the time that anita i vishali shailaja malika monica all of us maitri we were all um studying and doing out and we were so young and i think we can all connect to that feeling this is the wonderful feeling when you connect with your batchmates that you go back to that place where you started and i look at all of you and i think that all of you are in that place and we were already starting on our journeys so um i would we i would love to be a part of taking you forward and being open to supporting you in any way that you see fit so thank you for for calling me here now i'd like to um i wanted to kind of be a little provocative in my talk because i think our times ask for us to be provocative as um human beings in these very challenging times as scientists in the middle of a big uh global pandemic as women during the time of me too as um women of color as brown women uh, whether we see ourselves as that or not at the times of blm black lives matter i think that the world is really at a cusp of of great revolution right now and it does require us to be provocative and to ask ourselves hard questions so therefore i've i've titled my talk the greatest challenge you'll face after landing your dream job because i feel that part of the journey in life is not getting to a place of accomplishment but how to manage your life after you reach a place of accomplishment because once you you reach a certain level it's not that there's a fairy tale ends there and that uh everything goes according to plan it is precisely then that things start to fall apart that you are challenged that you go to places that you would never have expected to go to and that you must find resources that very often you are you are not prepared to tap into and so i'd like to reflect on that quite honestly with you um is my presentation being shown uh, because i um have uh, asked um for you to show this the presentation i will ask for the next slide yeah sure devanshi please get it yes sir uh, anshita can you please uh, show ma'am's ppt uh, please present your screen yes thank you so much and when ma'am says next slide kindly coordinate with her Yeah so I I put on I put on how I uh, healthcare entrepreneur and author as uh, as my title because I feel that I've worked across so many areas in in life science and I've also become a writer in the time and I I wanted to present myself to you in these two avatars really if I go to the next slide um you know I've put my bio up there for you because um I do want to pay respect to all the schools all the education systems that have nourished me including Dolathram College including Nanda ma'am Mudgal ma'am 
Nirmala Ma'am, Joshi Ma'am, all of, you know, they were a huge part of, uh, of my education and my, also my school teachers. And this comes back to me much more today in my 40s as I look back at myself when I was 15 or, or 18 or 20. So I think this is something that you will look back to and realize the value of what you are receiving many years from hence. And um, when you look at my bio, you might think that this reflects who I am as a person. But what I would like to challenge in your thinking is that our accomplishments or our education do not actually represent who we are, uh, nor the companies that we work at, uh, nor the job that we hold. But it is actually our inner values that and once we discover that side of ourselves, we are able to truly know who we are. So that is that is one of the over our, uh, overreaching arcs of my story as I as I show this to you. And in fact, I have dug deep into my own uh, social media. Uh, I've looked at pictures I've taken, places I've visited, and I've used that to to show all of you because I wanted to engage with a somewhat younger crowd than I've normally spoken to. I normally speak to PhD students or, or, or you know, managers in pharmaceutical companies. And as I told Anita, this is the first time I'm engaging with um, 18 to 21 year olds across different streams. So your feedback and your, um, you know, your appraisal is also very important to me. And I would love to know honest, on your honest thoughts after my talk, you could drop this to me in some in an email. I would love to know how you find this engaging with you because I cannot just give a merely scientific talk here. I need to give a talk that appeals to people across diverse backgrounds. So if you go to the next slide, I think that's when I start to really um, ask this question that, you know, we are a huge variety of people. And this is something that you see whether you live in India, whether you live abroad, Whatever stream you are in, you in your life you come across a deep a number of people of different backgrounds and types, and often when we are young, uh, who we are is reflected back to us in the culture and the values of the family, the society, and the country that we are born in, and we can model ourselves like Demi Moore has kind of she looks a little bit like Mahatma Gandhi in that picture on the right, but really you know we know that they are completely different personalities. So um, we, you know, we can model ourselves on people uh, on role models and uh, people that we admire, and this is a way that we start to identify our own values from the cultural or societal values that are passed down to us. So I think asking yourself who you are early on, the earlier on you ask yourself that and start to understand yourself, the better. And if you go to the next slide. I think now this is a picture from Art Basel in Basel, uh, where I live in Switzerland. And I, I really thought that it took me many years to work out who I was. Uh, when I was 18 or 19, I was very confident that I wanted to be a scientist, uh, that I was very clear about what my strengths were. And I think what I did discover in the 20 years after that is that I did not know many things that I loved, many things that I was good at. Uh, and that I also um, were, had a somewhat distorted perception of who I was because I would take feedback from other people as being more important than my own view of myself. So I, I, my, my, my challenge to you here would be that the first challenge is to know yourself, to not take other people's feedback always as the reflection of who you are, but to start to really ask yourself what it is you want to do with your life what it is that lights you up, what it is that really makes you feel that this is the passion that you want to dedicate your life to. And, and, and this is a very, very worthy question to ask. And it is a question that you can keep asking yourself for your whole life because life does, does not stay, it's, 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 it's in flow. Life is a, it's like a river in flow. It does not stay static. And therefore, a decision that you take in one year might not hold for you the next year. And it's been comfortable with that kind of flow and change that really, you know, identifies the arc of your life. And I think it's about making sure that you're true to yourself as you take those decisions. So if you go to the next slide, when you ask yourself what, um, um, what you could be, there are endless possibilities. And I think this is what is so wonderful about, um, about our uh, time today, you know, uh, we um, we have come we have come into a world now where uh, because of social media, because of travel, because of education, 
we can really choose many things or we can even choose to wear many hats at the same time. Um, I know myself from our batch that um, many of my batch mates were talented across many areas, not just science. We were all um, undergrads of biochemistry, but you know, within that, there were people who were great at writing, there were people who were great at music, there were people who wrote poetry, there were people who were amazing at cooking, there were people who were doing charity. I mean, um, just looking at my own batch, there were people who were amazing friends and uh, you know, married young and had children and were great mothers. So, so when I look at all of you, young girls starting out on your life, I don't want you to think that you need to limit yourself to choices you've already made, but always think that you have a lot of potential ahead and that there's so many, so many things that you can, uh, you know, really um, choose uh, to do and uh, to learn how to, to make those choices in accordance with your, with your true self. So if you go to the next slide. So once we've asked ourselves this question, the challenge, the first challenge I think is to not be distorted by, to not have a distorted perspective of ourselves from other people, but to know ourselves and then to go out and explore. Um, explore the world um, by reading, by traveling. I know we can't travel now, but you know, um, reading diverse influences, different writers, different um, uh, genres, and really, I think a part of being young and a part of being a student is, of course, doing well in the field that you have chosen, but also trying very much to interact with people from different uh, streams. So I had read this somewhere that a truly great team is made of very diverse people. So trying to have friendships or, um, or professional relationships with people who are very different from yourself do not always choose people from the same background or the same type of thinking or the same interests. Because from this, you will learn a lot about skills that you might not have or strengths that you might not have. So it's a very, very useful thing to, to know yourself and then to explore and to make new friendships, read new things, travel, learn about new areas without ever censoring yourself. So that's, I think, the first challenge. And if you go to the next slide, I think for me, and I would like to dwell here a little bit, um, the first challenge really was about, um, uh, you know, um, being willing to go um, abroad to study for my PhD in 99. I was lucky enough to get um, a scholarship from the government of India. Um, and um, my DRC um, teachers were a big part of my support system here. They really supported my decision. And at that age, I did not know what I was taking on. I joined uh, the lab of Linda Amos. Um, you can see her on the left in the wheelchair, the lady with white hair, um, at the University of Cambridge. And this, is, this photo is taken in 2002, just about the time that I was about to finish my PhD. And um, we were a very diverse set of people in the lab. And when I joined, um, MRC Lab of Molecular Biology, I was not aware of the weight of what I was going to carry because the LMB is the lab with the most number of Nobel laureates in the world. It has about 20 or 21 Nobel laureates as of now. By the time I joined it, there were already 14 Nobel laureates. And Linda Amos, my uh, PhD guide, was one of the brightest, most amazing human beings that I've ever met in my life. And uh, before I came to Cambridge, I did not know that she had multiple sclerosis. By a perfect twist of fate, I became an expert in multiple sclerosis at Novartis when I was working in my corporate career there in, uh, many years later in 2009, which is why I came to Basel in Switzerland when I was offered this job. I moved from London to, to Switzerland for this job. And I became an expert in multiple sclerosis. And as a young student then, I did not realize exactly what Linda was going through. Because um, even if you're a scientist, you cannot understand this until you actually almost live or, or walk that journey yourself. So you cannot really understand an illness or a disease, if, uh, which was my passion. My passion to work in science was because I really wanted to work with people in disease and to solve problems there. That was the whole reason I wanted to do a PhD. And yet, when I look back and reflect on this, I don't think I understood multiple sclerosis. 
Uh, Linda was an absolute expert in cryo-electron microscopy, and I was the last student that she taught this very complex uh, biophysical method. And um, um, she is she's she's still alive, but she was slowly losing the you know the ability to move her hands and legs. So I was the last person she could teach, uh, and she herself worked under the Nobel laureate Aaron Klug. Uh, and uh, she was one of the people who discovered very basic uh, um, scientific knowledge about the cytoskeleton and microtubules. So again, when I went to work with her, I was not aware of how um, lucky I was to work with someone like her, who was not only a brilliant scientist, but also a very good human being. And um, I really missed... Um, um, I really missed home. So when I first went to Cambridge, I actually was not very happy to be there, even though I had a full scholarship. I really missed my parents. I missed um, India and Delhi. And I, everything that I saw in Cambridge made me very, very homesick. So in a way, it took a lot of courage to do this. And um, even though it might have seemed a very happy uh, step in my, in my future, I, I, I remember really struggling with settling down when I first got to Cambridge. And um, if we go to the next slide, um, I actually started to work very diligently as I had been taught, as I had uh, learned, um, uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, if I've lost someone. Uh, could we go to the next slide? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I, um, I had learned to work very diligently, and so um, I actually had a, um, a project which was very difficult, which was looking at tau protein, which is a major protein in cytoskeleton modulation, the, uh, the, the, skeleton, the, cy the skeleton that makes up the cell structure and helps it to divide and, and reproduce. And um, uh, without, uh, without really realizing how difficult the project was, I really threw myself into it. And um, I, I actually was able to come up with a new, new theory, along with Linda, my, my PhD supervisor, about how microtubules were stabilized by tau protein by doing studies with two different kinds of drugs, one which is still used as a backbone of breast cancer, Taxol or Taxotere. It's newer derivative. Um, so I was working on this in 99, and I was able to show a competition between tau and Taxol which led us to speculate that uh, tau would bind in the same pocket on microtubules as taxol. And then I was able to pioneer a new technique by um, um, uh, attaching nanogold, so nanometer-sized particles of gold to tau protein, to then able to see these pictures uh, on the cryo-electron microscope to see where the protein was bound. And this was the first time this was done, and it was very exciting work. And now when I look back in my 40s at myself at this age, you know, 23 or so, I really think that um, um, I did some of my best work at that age. And uh, many of the things I did afterwards was not as, as wonderful as this, as being able to come up with uh, a really original theory and to be able to prove something that had not been done for 20 years before. And the reason that I'm sharing this with you in all humility is that I want you to understand your potential, that, um, that to really develop as a scientist or um, in any area of your, of your field, you do not have to have 15 years experience necessarily to, to, to come up with something new or to change the course of, of the area you're working in. And sometimes even without realizing it, you can have a major impact. And when you look back, this is one of the things that I'm most proud of, that I was able to diligently do these experiments and commit myself to this and work so well with my supervisor that we could come up with this theory. And in fact, the paper was accepted in Nature, which was considered the highest uh, achievement that you could have as a PhD student. And then Nature themselves said that it was so controversial that they would like to wait. And therefore, we sent it off to EMBO which was kind of second best. And it's because I was not so driven. I mean, we, we could have sat on it for a while and then published it in Nature if we would have extended our experiments or, or negotiated more. But I think this is one thing that as women, maybe, um, uh, you know, just being who I was, I was not so ambitious or so driven to really see what the difference to my career could have been with a Nature paper versus an EMBO paper. And still, when I look back, no matter that it was not in nature and that it came out in EMBO, 
this was still something of really uh, original scientific merit that I achieved really early on, and um, which I couldn't equal very easily later on, uh, no matter you know how hard I worked. So I really hope that this is what you can achieve in your life, because I really think this is the potential that we each have, which is really immeasurable and is not necessarily restricted by experience or age. So you should reach for the stars because even if you even if you don't get to the stars and you get to the moon, that's still a great destination. So I think that's that's um, that's the take-home message from that slide. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, then. Now I think what Cambridge bought to my um, experience was the ability to work. Uh, with many wonderful people uh, who were my peers, so people um, of my field, just like my batchmates from DRC. I'm so proud to know them. And they're such a nurturing community. In the same way, uh, we had a very nurturing community in Cambridge of our peers, but also of the people who uh, led our teams and who were our seniors, just like uh, uh, Saritananda ma'am and Mudgal ma'am. You know, so people who would nurture you and try to to raise you to your highest potential. And um, when I was a young student there, um, there was um, um, Max Perutz was still uh, the director of my institute, uh, the LMB, and he had won the Nobel Prize in '62 for the finding the structure of hemoglobin by X-ray crystallography. And uh, he was well into his 70s when he met me. And he was very, very friendly because he just saw this rather lost, um, extremely um, you know, meek um, young Indian girl. And he asked me if I'd ever been to a concert, which I hadn't. So he bought me my first concert tickets. One day I came to my PhD lab bench and I saw these tickets. And it was from Max with a little note saying, Sintwana, would you like to come with me to watch some, some music? So I actually went with Max and his wife, Gisela, who is on the, on the left-hand side in that picture. And I think uh, what is wonderful about going to places like that, to going to great universities, going to great uh, places of work, is that you get to meet minds like that, which raise you to a higher level. So very young um, on, I discovered how humble he was, how funny, how kind, and uh, qualities that I would imbibe and try to emulate for the rest of my life, because that basically set the standard. So we always look for role models in the people around us, and we always look for role models in the people who have accomplished what we want to accomplish. And so choose your role models wisely and choose well and be very, um, be, have, have a very high standard for who you choose. I don't think I could possibly have found a better role model so early on in life. And actually, Max was a great friend, even as he battled cancer and died from skin cancer in 2002. And his family asked me to speak at his obituary um, in Cambridge University. And I, being young and foolish, agreed, not knowing what I was taking on. So when I went to the podium that day, I was following uh, James Watson. Um, Linus Pauling's granddaughter was in the audience. I was the only brown woman to speak. I was the only student to speak that day. I was the only person below 25. And there were at least four or five Nobel laureates in the, in the audience. And I could not believe that I was being asked to speak with them about Max, about my personal experiences with Max. This was another highlight of my, of my life, which I have never spoken of before, uh, because I never wanted to appear proud I'm not proud because it does not reflect who I am, really. It just, it, it just shows you the principles of Max and his family, that they were so loving and that I, I mattered enough to them that they could give me the space to speak at their obituary. And I'd like you to all know that because I think that when you choose the right people, you get the right kind of respect. And it was really one of the most heart-stopping moments of my life. I remember walking up to the stage and seeing Jim Watson James Watson sitting in the front row and feeling that I would fall, trip over my shoes and fall on the stage and somehow making it to the stage and, you know, and speaking. And I, to, to date, I do not remember what I said. So, so just so you know, uh, so Max has given me some of the most exciting moments in my life and um, I remain in touch with his family. So 
uh, so challenge number one is finding yourself and along the way of finding yourself you will find great role models and uh, mentors who help you to find to find out who you are now moving on to the next slide now this slide um, is about staying true to yourself to your roots so I was very far from home I was in a, a very wonderful university and um, I still knew very much how much I love India and how much I loved home. Uh, these pictures that you see I, were taken in 2015 when I had gone to Orissa where my parents now live. And my mother took me to the small village of um, artists that live close to uh, Bhubaneswar, which is the capital of Orissa and where my parents live. And each home in this village is an artist's home. Every person in this family, every each family is blessed with at least one artist and so they paint and it's a very poor village and they paint and as you can see these are the ordinary houses there i've never seen more beautiful houses really than than what i than what i saw um you know um at, at this um at this um uh village and um, I remember buying a painting from um, one of the, the people that you can see, uh, you know, the man who's got the, uh, the painting, uh, you know, up, um, uh, the, who I saw at a distance and whom I came up to walk, uh, whom I walked up to and asked what he was painting. He had a picture from the Ramayan that he was painting. And I myself have um, read a lot of mythology. I've been very interested in as an academic. I had read, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and I felt I knew you know the Ramayan and the Mahabharat, and uh, when he and when I asked him, you know, it was a scene from the Ramayana, and he started to chant the verse in original Sanskrit with absolute um, passion and fervor. You know, with this wonderful love for 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 Lord Ram and for what he was painting. And I remember that my eyes filled up because um, it was so humbling to watch someone who was so gifted and so centered and it taught me a lot about my country and about the fact that that they had so much of devotion despite the difficult situations they were in and that they painted because this is what they thought God had asked them to do and that they did it without thinking about reward or recognition so for me this was a big lesson and I, I really find that every time I come back to India uh, my heart lifts up and I always find something to inspire me and teach me uh, about myself. So I'm very clear to myself that um, being, uh, you know, contributing to India and being Indian is a large part of my ethos. And this is something that I would, I will never let go of, no matter how long I live in another country. I've now lived more than 20 years out of India, but I just feel that it's very important to tell you that I discovered this um, not in my 20s, but more in my 30s, where it became very clear to me. And uh, just to say, because um, the next slide, uh, at that time I had already moved into working in pharma. So after, after publishing those two papers and uh, I'd moved across into market research and covering the pharmaceutical industry because I was a little frustrated with how long it took to uh, publishing uh, scientific facts. And um, if I could look back and advise my younger self, I'd have asked myself to hang on a little longer and to have probably moved into a lab in the US and uh, you know, worked harder because it's really nice if you have an original theory when you're in your early 20s. However, when I, uh, you know, um, I had moved on and I moved into pharma, which had a very different approach to, uh, to disease. And um, um, I started to collaborate with the editor of Nature Drug Discovery to talk, um, I have over 15 uh, publications, uh, talking about cutting edge um, pipeline drugs. And the paper that I'm most proud of is the one that I co-wrote, co-authored with my father, um, called Control of Malaria, which came out in 2010 in Nature Drug Discovery. Because my father has been working on malaria since the late 70s and uh, you know he's um, he's a very passionate scientist and he has taught me many of the principles with which I live by and it was really a kind of coming of age that I was old enough to actually sit down with my father and write a paper with him I cannot explain the emotions but I have a feeling that you will understand it was really really the paper I'm most proud of uh, so happy and so proud to see my name next to his in a scientific journal so I think um, the challenge is always to understand your passion and your roots and to stay true to that. So this, this kind of summarizes that. 
Then if we go to the next, um, to the next slide, please. Uh, so this, this slide is what I would call, you know, the googly slide or the unexpected slide. Um, life will throw you challenges and I think the real challenges in your life are not the ones you predict. It's not about failing an exam or being fired uh, at your job or um, having, um, you know, breaking up a relationship with a loved one. Uh, these are huge challenges. I'm not saying uh, that they are not. Um, uh, in fact, I've had all of these experiences. But I would say that the biggest challenge is the unexpected. It is uh, what you hadn't foreseen, the kind of challenge that comes up to you from behind, which in, in, within seconds changes your life and, um, and, and really changes you as a person and makes you have to dig really deep to face the challenge. So for me, uh, it was a wonderful blessing to to become pregnant and to have my daughter, Maya, who was born in 2011. And uh, because uh, Nanda Ma'am um, also touched down on it, I did fall very se se seriously ill when, uh, when my daughter was born. And uh, at the time of her birth, I was diagnosed with a very rare tumor type um, and was given three months to live. And uh, this for me was the most humbling and, um, and um, enriching experience. I can see enriching now, you see, I would, it, uh, but even at that time I was very calm. And so by having this experience, um, I had, they had no sickness in the family before. I had learned to take care of family members whom I deeply loved. Um, so I had experienced this before, but it was really, it was really pushed the challenge much higher when I was living in a foreign country. I did not have any family nearby other than my husband. And my daughter came early. She was three weeks early, so we hadn't prepared for it. And then I got this diagnosis uh, within five days of her birth. And uh, it really taught me a lot about myself. It was, a, um, and in a way, I think that, so it's exactly what I was saying, that you, you cannot predict or foresee this challenge, and then it tells you who you are. And essentially, um, it, it really made me dig deeper into my spiritual roots to find uh, calmness and composure and healing from spiritual uh, ways of life. And I started to follow um, a more holistic approach to health that completely changed me as a person. Before, I'd been very much a scientist who believed mainly in uh, drugs being able to stop uh, a disease. And then I found out for the first time, I'd read so much about cancer and written reports and I'd worked on Taxol and that I really didn't know what it felt like to be told that there was no treatment, that you had three months to live, that they would have to have a surgery uh, and that I found my soul saying I could not have surgery. And I actually never had a surgery, uh, you know, after that, because um, I um, actually tried to heal myself um, with functional medicine. And so I learned a lot about, so in this way, I learned a lot about a completely new aspect of healthcare, which is when you're in a situation where there is no treatment, what do you do? And from this was born the desire of, um, of founding a company that would, um, so I could not go back to work with Novartis because I was too ill, so I took some time to recover. And then I actually co-founded um, a natural care company, a healthcare company, where we made, um, uh, we had a pipeline of drugs and a leading natural product um, of uh, which, which was uh, basically we used a patented uh, method to, to make it very highly bioavailable, where we worked with uh, people with cancer with limited or no treatment options. So over the span of about four or five years, I earned very little money, as I would find out as an entrepreneur, you often do, but I earned the wealth of experience of working with people in a very difficult situation and being able to give back in a way uh, that allowed me to kind of fight the circumstances I was in, because even though I was looking stable and I had no regrowth, I had a lot of monitoring. I had to go back every three months or six months for a scan. And every time I would go back for a scan, I would be facing the truth of whether I was going to have a recurrence or not. And all the time while having this very adorable child with me. So this was something that taught me a lot about the human condition. If I had ego or pride, it broke it completely because I really learned to, uh, to, to understand what compassion was and what it meant 
to deal with people with illness. And so to work, to continue to work in healthcare, we need more people with great compassion, people who do not think about profit, who do not think about prestige, who do not think about whether their papers are in, uh, you know, in nature or in journals, but are really thinking of making a difference. And often you cannot think like that unless you've suffered yourself. So suffering by itself might seem scary, but I think is the greatest transformation. So sometimes when you go through an unexpected challenge, accept it as a gift from God that this is a, an, a chance and an opportunity to truly transform yourself and to let go of old habits and old ways of thinking. And I think that's, uh, that's the message that came through that. And if you go to the next slide, parenthood will teach you many things. Um, if, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I don't know if it's frozen. Uh, oh, yes, uh, I think we've jumped now. So if you could go back one to the unexpected baker, the, the previous, yes. So I think parenthood will teach you many things and it'll teach you that you want to give the best you want to your child and um, everything that you had and much more. Uh, you know, I think that's how nearly all of us who are parents will tell you, whether we are mothers or fathers, I think this, this is irrespective of gender. And uh, because I couldn't work for some time and because I was used to big challenges, I decided to challenge myself with cakes. So, you know, the cake on the top um, is the first cake, you know, I was making for my daughter's birthday, which was a checkered cake. So, you know, it's, it required making two different kinds of cake and piling them up and cutting them and then, so that they would have that brown and white striation. And from that, I, I every year for my daughter, I would make the best cake that I could make myself at home. And I ended up making this Barbie cake for her that you see, you know, which took me four or five hours <laughs> Uh, seven hours perhaps to bake uh, with you know all the jewelry intact a Bollywood dancer no less and um, as a, it was not merely an act of love clearly there was a lot of love in it but I think it's it came from recognizing myself and knowing that what I really liked was a great challenge and a great challenge could be solving a scientific problem but it could also be baking a really wonderful cake for your family and it taught me to respect very much what my mother had done for me, what my aunts, um, what my friends, um, my friends' parents had done for me, you know, in great meals and making these memories that would last, you know, for your, your children for a lifetime, which is actually celebrating life and making, and making uh, you know, making uh, a gesture that they would remember. So from this, you know, if you go to the next slide, I was quite a perfectionist, so it was about making a cake from scratch and then having this party for all these people from different parts of the world, which was a Bollywood themed party. And then I also became the Bollywood dancer. So I also taught these young children some Bollywood steps, something that I've never done in my life. I think Anita and Vaishali and Shailaja can reaffirm that to you. I never used to dance and I, I started to dance with the children so that they would learn some steps. And the real uh, victory was that the cake was fully eaten. The proof of the pudding is in its eating. And so I think this is something that, you know, I learned from, from, uh, from this experience that uh, you could publish a paper, but uh, you can, you know, baking a cake can also be a very, very valuable challenge. And uh, for me, this was extremely satisfying and nurturing as well. So I just want you to reflect on that because um, it's really important to not only think of, um, uh, professional credentials, a professional acknowledgement as being the highest fruit, but also looking at um, keeping your family safe and happy and healthy and making time for the big anniversaries and events in their life, no matter how busy your schedule. So I think that was that's something that I wanted to bring by home to you um, from this slide. Uh, the next, if I could have the next slide, please. So I think so from knowing your passion, you know, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and taking the curveballs that fate will throw you, I think that would lead me on to the next challenge, which is this will help you to identify your team. You know, find out who are the people who are your friends, who are your true friends, because the real challenge, um, and I know this because I've, you know, talked this over with everyone, and I know that 
Anita or Vaishali or Shailaja, we can, they can all weigh in. You know, um, this is, uh, you know, when you have a real challenge in life, you, you'll find out who your true friends are. You'll find out the value of laughter, simple things like laughter. And um, I was very blessed to have a great set of friends and, um, you know, knowing and loving my deep family roots. So the picture on the left is with my aunt, whom I hadn't seen for more than 10 years. Um, she's the elder sister of my father, who's sitting next to her. And, you know, it was a very emotional meeting. I met them after many years in India. And on the right are several of my friends who have really loved me, you know, whether or not I had good health, whether or not I had a job, whether or not I was successful. And I think that's very important. Uh, you can actually see one of our alumni, Maitri Swaminathan, in the picture where we are both competing for the sandwich, which was in New York. So Maitri was taking me around New York. She's now a group leader in in um, in South Carolina. And um, I, I'm, I'm so enriched that we have these friendships which are over 20 years old. Um, and uh, so I would say that know your team and try to find out the people that you can rely on as early on in life as you can, the people that you can laugh with, um, you know, the people that you can admit your failures to, because uh, we are never going to get through life without failing. And I think it's really important to say this because uh, people are often only allowed to speak when they're successful. We are not allowed to, um, and in a very male dominated world, as, Norman, as Nanda Man said, and the corporate world is even more male dominated, the academic world has still got some strong female uh, leaders, but the corporate world has very few strong female leaders. Um, you, you, uh, the male way of looking at, uh, at life is not to talk about failures and, and to talk about success all the time. And I think with, with the rebalancing, when we have more and more female leaders, we'll see that we'll be able to talk about failures, about things that didn't work, and it's okay to make a mistake. This is something I've always told my team. And I have to say that my team used to perform very well when we had this ideology, as opposed to when I would say that you only had to be successful. So I think to make a good team, you you need to uh, you know you need to really uh, know who they are. And um, so just to go to the next slide and to kind of summarize you know that 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 challenge about knowing your team. Uh, what you will find out is, so this is a picture of me and Maya in, in Vienna in Austria in 2016. Uh, my husband had to travel at that time, and so um, I, I needed to go to the ENC Neurosciences Conference in Austria for Johnson & Johnson, for whom I was working for as a senior director then. Uh, for the neurosciences and infectious disease team. And uh, I took Maya along. And this was the first time I'd done something like that. And uh, the conference themselves had a child care uh, system. So it was really very amazing that they were supporting women by, by doing that. So uh, I could put Maya in there from nine to five, and she was very happy to go there. And then I told my team that I could not make any team dinners, any networking dinners, because I had my daughter with me. And um, I took her to the, to the children's palace. The Schoenberg uh, Palace is very famous in Vienna, and there's a children's palace there. And I took her there, and then we found out that there was going to be um, an opera um, for um, it was an opera which had a wonderful um, uh, piece which was called Meow. It was where all the opera singers meowed on stage, and it was so utterly captivating for my daughter. Uh, and I felt so happy um, not only that I could attend the conference, but that I could take my daughter with me and give her this experience. So I think this is, uh, you know, that you want to give the support that you would like to receive. So I think it was really important for my daughter as well to see that her mother could be very passionate about her work, but also had time and space for her. And this is also something that I think females, will be, uh, women will be much better at than men, because I think we are very emotionally connected to our family. And this is a huge advantage we have, in a, you, know, you know, men also have it, but I think women tend to have it much more easily. So I'd say support your family um, you know if you make this decision to to have a family to be married and you don't have to obviously have make that decision it's perfectly fine not to marry or have children but when you make the decision to marry or to have a family then show the commitment to them because uh, they are going to be your team they're going to be the people you go back to when everything else has failed and make those memories and these wonderful experiences because they enrich your work experience as well so then uh, I'd like to move on. So from, from this, um, 
during the time at Johnson & Johnson, I was already starting to write. And in 2016, uh, the year I joined Johnson & Johnson, I also found an agent for my novel. I wrote my first novel over um, 2009 to 2012, and then spent four years learning about writing and editing it. And um, uh, my father and my husband were big supports in, in this in this uh, learning curve, you know, to, to, because I used to go for, my father would always encourage me to do this, and I would go for day-long workshops in Geneva, which is um, four hours by train one way from Basel, and my husband would take care of my daughter while I did that. And in this way, I learned enough about writing to be able to submit my novel to an agent, and I got an agent. So the next slide is actually that I had mentors like Linda, and Jan is my PhD co-supervisor on the right, who is now the director of, um, of um, um, the LMB, so you know the position that Max Perutz has, Jan, my co-supervisor, has. Uh, uh, it just makes me so proud when I look at that. And um, the girl on my right, uh, Annie, uh, she was also a Commonwealth scholar like me from Malaysia, and she's gone back to be a lecturer in Nottingham University. And in fact, she has cancer and um, has been on stage four for a few years. And she and I have this wonderful friendship uh, where we support each other, where we laugh a lot, uh, you know, and where she, where I can send her information about good functional medicines because in Malaysia she does not have that kind of support. So I'm still linked to many people in that photograph. And uh, the girl next to her in the gray gown, Susie, is also a very good friend of mine who went on after her PhD to do a, 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 a doctor's degree and is an anesthologist in a leading uh, in a leading uh, hospital in, in London and uh, is an amazing friend that drops drops by us and, you know, is, is a wonderful aunt to, to Maya. So, you know, we have these friendships and mentorships from that side. And then I started to get writing mentorships. So at a workshop in Geneva, I met uh, the man that you see next to me, uh, Romesh, um, the man with specs. He's Sri Lankan in origin and his, uh, um, his second novel was nominated for a Man Booker Prize. And he has been my mentor for writing my first novel for the last two years. So I had to qualify. That was another scholarship that I had to qualify for that I haven't written in my bio. And Ramesh has been helping me. He helped me to submit my novel. He's helping me to, to, to hone my poetry. So I think what is very, very important as a part of your learning curve is having great men mentors good role models and realizing too that you are a role model. So as women in your position who are studying undergrads in such a wonderful place like uh, Delhi University, you are a role model to the young girl um, who's, in your, who's a neighbor and so on. So, you know, uh, you not only do you uh, find good mentors, but you yourself become a mentor or a role model for people. And you, and that is how I think it's important to carry yourself if you truly want to live um, an, an enriched life. So uh, I was very happy to have Romesh as my, as my mentor. And then if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, in 2019, I came back to India. Um, I came back to India to go to the Jaipur Literary Festival. I only had time for that, for one week of that, because I had so much work that I couldn't stay for more than one week. And at the Jaipur Literary Festival, I met Yan uh, Martel, the author of Life of Pi. That's the picture that you see to the bottom right is him. Um, I met Mahesh Vinakran, who is a wonderful musician. That's the person you see on the, on the top right. And his father, Vikku Vinakran, who is um, one of the most famous musicians we have, who won a Grammy Award and a Padma Shri in India. And um, and uh, I basically, you know, have uh, made uh, Mahesh Mahesh Chisla is a friend, and uh, Tripti Pandey is also a writer. Uh, she's the younger uh, sister of Ila Arun, the singer. And Tripti Tripti Ji was releasing a book which I bought, and she became a very dear friend as well. And uh, I ran into Jan Martel at the airport as I was flying out from Jaipur back to to Switzerland. And I'm always very sad when I'm leaving India. And it was a wonderful thing to see him. And I went up to him and said I loved his book, his latest book, which was Beatrice uh, and uh, Beatrice um, and Virgil. And uh, we and then he he uh, I said that I'm writing my first novel too. And uh, Jan Martel said I wish you the best for your novel. And for me, those words meant a lot because they came from someone as accomplished as he is. Because I'd heard him speak 
at the Jaipur Literary Festival, and he's a wonderful speaker and a wonderful human being who really loves India a lot. So as, as, you, as you continue on your path, you'll see that you'll find more and more mentors and more and more experiences that are very enriching. And uh, that's what I would like to, you know, show you as a kind of way of um, of feeling, uh, you know, what is the what are the what is the goal? It's just it's there's no end. But as you go along the way, your experiences are extremely pleasant. If you go to the next slide, um, and I'm coming now to the end of my talk. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the challenge, uh, which is the last challenge I'll talk about, which is the fairy tale. So I'd like to kind of tell you a little story at the end of this talk. Uh, which is based on a really funny book I found a few a couple of years ago called The Trouble with Women. It's written by a woman called Jackie Fleming. And I bought it up as a way of provocation because Anita had sent in the talk, uh, you know, the talk summary. And this whole talk is about women and showing women their potential and, dis and uh, finding role models and uh, hearing from women who have made, who are pioneers in their field. And obviously, um, Anita, who is herself uh, such a wonderful colleague to have, uh, had described Marie Curie and Rosalind Franklin. Um, and um, uh, when I looked at that, I felt a little cynical because I myself know how much uh, bullying Rosalind Franklin received from James Watson and Francis Crick, and that she was never granted the Nobel Prize because she died. It's not given posthumously, but uh, it, it's kind of known. It's a, it's a, it, and it's a story that's also told in the double helix as written by James Watson that they actually uh, took the pictures of x-ray crystallography um, that Rosalind Franklin had taken of the DNA helix without a permission and used that to interpret and get their Nobel Prize. So it's, it's, it's so when we looked at Marie Curie, you know, uh, Marie Curie was, seems to be the only scientist when you look back at, at, um, at time, you know, you'll see that very rare, there are so few women scientists, especially in the beginning. And this is this novel, this book kind of makes fun of that. So if you go to the next slide, it really talks about how women's positions were 200 years ago. I'm not talking about 2000 years ago because I think there have been ebbs and flow in the role of women in society. But 200 years ago, we were kind of aligned to the domestic sphere. We had to. Uh, we, we were had to do the easy jobs, which were, you know, scrubbing the floor and having babies and taking care of babies. And as a mother myself, I would say, and I'm sure that there are so many people in this um, uh, social room, a networking room that will agree with me that motherhood is indeed the most difficult job of all, much more difficult than going to a board meeting. And, uh, and there's very little credit given for that. And they're very famous people who also, like Darwin, and uh, you know, who, who kind of questioned, you know, the intelligence of women. So she, this author has kind of made fun of it a little bit, but she talked about the fact that women were considered biologically inferior because they were not even allowed to compete in the first place. And then if you go to the next slide, it was about genius, that basically women could not be ge uh, genius. In the olden times, there were no women because basically, uh, you know, all the geniuses were men. And, and, and we know that that is a myth. It was just that women were not allowed to be famous and that the women who tried to be, you know, who were geniuses were often pushed down. So, uh, you know, uh, there's a famous philosopher here who also said that, and this is a bit of a joke, but, you know, he's, he's he basically, the and it, it was really questioned whether women had the ability or the scientific or intellectual acumen to achieve the same as men. And this was a very, popular theory till not too long ago. So I think I want you to reflect on that because where we are today is a position of great privilege and we still have a long way to go, but we have come a very long way. So if you go to the next slide, uh, any woman who, who, who tried to step out of the norm was often made fun of, like the woman in the picture on the left. And even Ruskin Bond basically said that the main role of women was really to, to applaud men for their success. And even an artist like Picasso, so basically they are quotes, and it's shown in a very lighthearted way, but these are serious quotes from philosophers and scientists and artists that say that women really did not, were not able to produce great art or great philosophical theories because they did not have the intellectual acumen or the, 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 the physical stamina or strength. And this is something that we must remember because this is still something that is coming up as a repeat theme even today.
And uh, therefore, we must appreciate our privilege and we must think about how we continue that uh, to pass on that privilege. And so I'm kind of this brings me to the end of my talk, which is to summarize to all of you that what I think were the great learnings when I really look back on the last 20 years of my life is to find great mentors, great role models, people that you'd like to be like, to really go deep and see who they really are, not on the surface. Try to form those friendships and relationships with people that you admire. And remember that mentorship is not just a talk or a few meetings, but often it is a long, you need to have a mentor for years to actually grow and somebody who challenges you and stretches you to your full potential. And also that you yourself in your position as an educated woman, you are already a role model. And so, you know, help someone else to, to, to rise, um, help your a maid's daughter or son to get an education. Do what you can to bring people along with you uh, because you're already, you know, have been given great opportunities by having an education. Bust the myth that women are not capable. Uh, show up as an equal and uh, show up as an equal, neither superior nor inferior, but as an equal and stand up for what you believe in. Really, um, if you believe you're a strong scientist, do not be too humble about it. You can be assured, self-assured about it. If you think you're a great um, social philosopher or uh, psychiatrist or whatever it is that you choose to do, then do not apologize for it ever. And um, challenge yourself to grow, you know, to, to find out aspects of yourself that take you out from your cultural heritage and your social background into new arenas. And get out of your own way means uh, very often we talk negatively to ourselves. And when we connect to ourselves and really try to find um, our core, that is when you know it is okay to say to yourself, hey, you're good. Hey, I'm proud of you. You can actually say things like that to yourself. Nurture yourself. Treat yourself like you would your own child. This is a very good piece of advice. I always tell Maya how wonderful she is. I never tell her that she's less. I never tell her that she's bad or um, or that she's less or, or that what she's done makes me ashamed. I always tell her I'm proud of her. And even when she hasn't done something too well, I always try to see the positive. And if we can do that for our children or for our younger brothers and sisters, we must do that for ourselves. So praise yourself, give yourself a pat on the back. And in the end, if you are somebody who's very gifted and who has huge intellectual ca capacities and you win awards and prizes and gold medals, do not um, be ashamed to share that. And if people around you seem jealous or they seem um, uh, you know, afraid of how successful you are, I would say do not dim your light, but shine your brightest. Because by shining your brightest, you give people the, a good example to shine brighter. So don't try to blend in and uh, not talk about your achievements or try to hide them actively so that other people feel comfortable. Always shine the brightest you, uh, you can because that's what we're here for. I'd like to end this talk with a poem that I wrote for my mother. I see I have 20 seconds, so I think I'm really a uh, good time, Anita. Uh, I, I told her that I wouldn't be able to talk for an hour, but I think I have. And this is a poem I did in a workshop two or three months, um, uh, two or three months ago. Um, and um, it was an exercise where we start the poem with the line my mother never told me. So I'd just like to read this poem to you as the end of my talk. My mother never told me she could play the guitar. Her fingers like flower stems, her eyes full of fire. My mother always told me not to trust men. She was smart and clever. She had a master's in chem. My mother never told me why she rages at her mother so much. My granny is dove-like in white, both lives by sepia touched. My, no my mother never told me she wanted to fly. We were her burden, but I knew, I knew. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ka. These were the beautiful lines. And I would not stop myself to just say that it was an insightful talk. Your talk was an inspiration to us. And I can say on behalf of all the students that your story, your journey, it is so inspirational. It has moved us all and we are humbled 
to have you with us and uh, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us thank you so much i would thank now you. like to invite uh, bhavya pande vice president of the cell to kindly moderate the question answer session and we have a lot of questions coming in so she will moderate and since we have uh, less time we would like to thank all the participants to sending in their questions thank you so much bhavya you can continue now thank you um ma'am i won't be uh, asking you a lot of questions I won't be bothering you so much uh, because there is paucity of time but there are a few questions that have been repeatedly asked and um i'll just like to begin with one of the questions sent in by one of our faculty members uh, rashmi ma'am she is from the english department and she asks what gave you the inspiration to pen down novels please shed some light on them and how someone can take the first step towards realizing that they have creative potential and they can truly do something um, beyond their regular um, sort of tawdry day to day work well wonderful question bhavya thank you uh, i have to say i feel so happy when i see all of you that i just really really wish covid wasn't there and we could all have had a meal together after this talk when i could have just leaned back thank you for that wonderful question i think that we are all artists and especially as children we are very connected to that and this is where the question of distortion comes in that we are often told to you know find a job that pays the bills um or to fulfill sometimes our own parents uh, unexpected uh, uh, unfulfilled expectations so if they hadn't done something they want you to do it you know for them bete humne ne kiya to tum karke dikhana and all that kind of thing so you know we 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 and when we are young we we kind of without thinking straight we think that this is what um we we should do you know we'll do what our parents tell us or what our friends tell us we're good at but if then when we're really connected to ourselves i think nearly every person i've talked to has an artistic capability whether it's singing or music or cooking or designing they have some form of artistic capability and often that artistic ability is a direct connection back to your soul and that's why it's really important because it's not through the mind it's not through the mind and and the intellect and scientific thick rigor is often through the mind it also can be through the soul but it's often through the mind carl jung is a great psychiatrist who also connected to himself through his soul while freud is a great uh, psychiatrist who connected mainly through his mind and when i read both their works i do not really appreciate freud's as much as i appreciate carl jung's so um you know stephen hawking did not believe in god but came up with the beautiful theory of black holes so you can achieve huge success with your with your mind but when you connect also to your soul then you know it's a lot of fun it's play time and and a lot of life has to be about play time what tells us that we need to be serious all the time and you know to to be successful we we don't smile and we always carry ourselves with great seriousness so i think when i fell really ill i asked myself what did i regret because i was actually being asked to, you know i i knew that i was being asked to consider the fact that i didn't have very long to live and when i looked at my life i said you know i'm okay you know i've had a good life i've traveled a lot i've studied i uh, haven't done anything horribly wrong i haven't murdered anyone yet you know i've even given birth to a little uh, daughter and i appreciate these things and if god wants this i'm okay with this but what do i regret i regretted not finishing my novel and so i started to write even when i was ill and as i wrote i seemed to get a longer and longer lifeline and maybe god said oh you know maybe she should write a little bit more in a no funny way i kind of felt that i was been given a lifeline because i was connecting to my soul and i decided never to let that connection go again so um i continued to write and then um i thought i could never write poetry because poetry is very raw it's very there is no excuse there's no hiding behind lengthy sentences and so a few months ago with the corona thing and you know uh, all of us got found it very challenging and i was finding it too and then one of my friends was doing this workshop and when i went for it and then she challenged me to write something on my mother my mother has not heard this poem but my mother has been such a major influence in my life and so you know this poem came out in 5 minutes and i thought wow you know something really complex that i've had in my head you know my mother was a great pioneer in her family you know the only person who had a masters in that day and age as nanda ma'am said you know that our mothers had very different lives than us and so she had that but she gave it all up to have us and so i really respect and love my mother and and that poem came out so if you can get that in 5 minutes you know why not go for it 
right right so that makes sense the biggest takeaway is to look for your soul food i think i think that that would be it thank you uh i would just take a second to read out a few comments uh, from faculty members who they've left such nice things uh, about your talk in the chat box uh, dr lena wijman says that you are true inspiration and she thanks you for sharing your story uh, padmasri mudgal man says that you had a very moving and inspirational journey uh dr minakshi sharma ma'am says that uh, you have given strength uh, to a lot of other people to achieve their dreams and i think that summarizes all of our thoughts uh, quite aptly um uh, i will take one more question from one of uh, our students um, i would like to add uh, if you will put a student yes, of 93 to 96 batch biochemistry department who is present here everyone has a story to tell and that is the biggest bond which has joined us i hope sampna agrees to me like that we oh, all yes. but we all are together and it's been 28 years and thanks to drc who joined us so irrespective of where we are and all of us have a different journey and all of us had our own share of obstacles uh, but all of us have done fairly well i would say so anita yes. i think we need another webinar for it no <laughs> <laughs> ma'am has to give us permission <laughs> So we really like to hear your stories you know really i think santwana it was amazing amazing and really moving i was really moved by your story and uh, no ma'am you know, have us also tomorrow is bashali then shalaja has something to tell malika has monica has maitri has all of us have reached somewhere uh, by god's grace but we all have gone through a, a yeah. bit of challenge yes. of cycles all of us But yes, then, Anita. That's a huge, that's a very important. That's a very important thing that Anita is saying. That all our journeys are valid. All our journeys are valuable. Nobody is ahead and nobody is behind. You know, uh, as I've uh, Anita and I have shared our personal stories with, uh, you know, with my three, with so many of my friends. Um, I just carry these as my uh, armor. You know, that like, uh, it help, gives you a lot of courage um, when you hear the authentic stories of your friends. You know what they've overcome. uh so for me that's why it's a very personal story to all of you it's not something that i would share on a public platform into this level or depth but i would like you to know it because it becomes more personal when you have that connection and each story is amazing and i'm learning so much from anita you know it's so amazing how our conversations are so enriching today because we are both learning a lot about natural foods and health uh, health systems and it's just so enjoyable to talk with anita even today we have so much to learn from each other thank you that's really nice to hear ma'am i'll just take one more question from one of our students um anupriya uh, she asks that what do you think is the most significant barrier to female leadership and a similar question by anshil asks what what will be the biggest challenge for the generation of women behind you who want to follow your steps essentially students like us who are just starting out we're sort of in the middle we're not too privileged we're not too uh, too much burdened with responsibilities so what do you what do you think that the, the biggest challenge can be for them and how they should be having that sort of an open mind uh, while while they tackle such challenges what a wonderful question to have you when i see all of you anita i feel so proud because i feel that uh, this generation is five steps ahead of us you're so eloquent so um so present i just feel so proud of you i feel you know you're you're the age of my daughter like you could be my daughter and they're, they're so intelligent you're so it's wonderful to see this so i would say that you're already five steps ahead of where we were when we were your age and i think and i'm quoting michelle obama here um who is one of my inspirational role models and i would advise all of you to go listen to her podcasts on spotify if you can uh because she addresses this issue the biggest hurdle in your path is yourself it's not anyone else it's not anyone else's perception it's what you think you can achieve and what you give yourself permission to achieve if you decide that you want to be the first um or the second female prime minister of india you can do that uh it's 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 what you give yourself permission to do i think the biggest the hurdle in our path is our own our own negative self talk when we say we can't do this or we're not determined enough or and ded- dedicated enough when you make a commitment to do something you're going to have to do the hard work and the discipline there isn't a way around that you can pray uh you could have devotion maybe that would make your path easier but you still have to put in the discipline and hard work and i'd say that the 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 talk that you do to yourself your inner talk 
is what is really crucial to driving you, to giving you focus, to giving you determination. So when you sit down and make a plan and you think that this is what you want to achieve, don't let anyone talk you out of that. Don't let anyone tell you you're not good enough or that uh, it's not done by girls or it's not done in this society or this is not possible because no one else has done it. Whatever it is that you think your dream is, once you have that dream and you kind of assess that you think you are able to do it, then do not let anyone talk you out of it and stick to the path. It might take you a bit longer than you had expected, but you'll get there. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think that answered some of my own questions and a few inhibitions that they do creep up sometimes. So that I will, I will tie this in a knot and I'm going to keep this with myself. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would now ask Devanti D to please take over uh, for the rest of the segment. Thank you so much, Bhavya. Uh, WDCTRC, no, uh, sorry, apologies. I would now like to request Dr. Sarita Nanda Ma'am, teacher in charge and associate professor, biochemistry department, to share her views on today's session. Devanji Sarita is busy somewhere. So Padmishri is here. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Padmishri, please. Yeah. Santhana, what a pleasure it was to hear. You know, you really are a storyteller. The way you, you know, you have webbed, formed a web of a story and your own journey, it was really touching and how you overcame these challenges. I think uh, what could be a better role model than you? I think the present students, uh, you know, it's really inspirational and motivation how you, you know, overcome the challenges and found uh, new milestones and reached new milestones. And what is, uh, you know, I don't think you've left anything untouched, you know. You are, uh, you are a poet, you are a novelist, you are a scientist. You know, I don't know what other milestones you have, uh, you know, created for yourself to uh, achieve more and more. And I really would love to, sorry, uh, we love to be, uh, and I don't know why we didn't keep in touch. And, uh, uh, and all other batch moves, Vaishali uh, uh, has been with us, has been coming over the years to Delhi, and whenever she comes, she visits us. So we hope that whenever you are coming next time, you know, we can have a live uh, uh, live uh, interaction with you, and the students can really gain from your experience. And I think what you have achieved, um, uh, it's uh, almost like a dream story, you know, <laughs> with um, how uh, overcome one overcomes the challenges and reaches where you have reached. And we are really proud of you. And I think Sarita has joined in. She'd like to add in to what I have said. <laughs> uh, really, I'm really proud of you, Sankwana. And uh, wish you Thank all you. the best. We all the best in life. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Padam Shri, ma'am. I'm so, uh, my mind is really boggled right now. I have so many things to say and I'm so inspired. And all of the, all of the students that are here, they're just inspired by your story. And uh, with this, I would now like to uh, begin with the felicitation. Uh, WDCDRC takes you. immense- hey, ma I think Nanda ma'am has joined. So uh, let ma'am attend. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma uh, I would request the technical team to stop presenting now and I would also request Dr. Sarita Nanda, teacher in charge and associate professor, biochemistry department and also our vice principal to kindly address the session. And mute yourself.
Dr. Nanda, you please come in my office. She's in the adjacent room, you know. Oh, <laughs> some, some technical <laughs> problem. Oh, some uh, network <laughs> problem. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, you have got another teacher of chemistry department also. You uh, you have got another teacher of chemistry department. If you can recognize, please take off your mask. Can you come closer a little bit? She must have. Taught you chemistry. If you are a uh, classmate of Anita, then uh, yes, yes, in organic and yes, yeah, indeed. Do you recollect my name? Let me no, see. no, 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 I do not. Friend from music. I have taught you physical chemistry. Yes, yes. ma'am. I remember physical Can chemistry. I remember it very well. Ask Anita, she will tell you my name. Ma'am, we all remember, ma'am. How can we forget our physical <laughs> chemistry department? So she was also here with me listening to you. So Dr. Nanda is here now. Dr. Nanda, please take over. The teachers will be proud of you. Good. Keep going. Thank you. So it was very nice hearing Santwana. Is it being So it was very nice uh, to hear from Santwana. The best thing I have liked about Santwana because I've also her Facebook friend, so I've been following her, uh, you know, uh, for so, uh, several years. And what I liked about is her resilience. You know, after uh, this is one great thing that if you are uh, you are high in career and you have some health issues and then uh, you go through the lower, I mean, the ups and downs you go through with great, uh, you know, strength and then you recover and come back with the impact. That is something which is, you know, which everybody of us have to learn from each other that how we can uh, have that sort of a strength. And as she said that it was uh, spiritually, she got awakened and, uh, you know, and she got into, so it's not only the intellectual upliftment or uh, the growth, which is important, but then, you know, the multi-dimensional uh, growth, which is very, very important that you give back to the society, something which, you know, gives you the strength to be more strong and uh, when you get that appreciation from the community you do much better so this is a challenge which we all face and uh, santwana is a live uh, example like she's with her lifestyle and then uh, you know that is what she said that initially like uh, she wanted her publications if she had publications in nature it would have help her this is what it is that we should know what we want to achieve and have the patience to achieve that so it was a, a very good example that you have given and then many of us you know can achieve greater heights but we don't know what is the you know what is good for us and we don't have the patience so thank you santhana and we like to hear more from you and interact when you come to india thank you thank you ma'am uh, ma'am, I can just see that uh, Dr. Mudgal ma'am has pressed on the raised hand icon. Do you want to add something? It was just by mistake. It was by mistake. <laughs> oh, okay, ma'am. Okay, ma I thought you wanted to add something. Yeah. It was a real pleasure. It was Can a real be... pleasure listening to you, Santana, really. WDC DRC takes immense pleasure in extending our gratitude and regard to our guest of honor, our principal, our speaker for the day, a convener ma'am, our Dr. Padmashi Mudgal ma'am, Dr. Sneeta Joshi ma'am, Dr. Sarita Nanda ma'am, and all of the dignitaries, all the faculty members, and all the students for joining us today. I request Dr. Aditi Puri ma'am and Ms. Isha Bhatt ma'am 
to present this token of respect and appreciation to Dr. Santanakar. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now we would request Ms. Raman Aurora, ma'am, to present this token of appreciation and gratitude to our vice principal, Dr. Sarita Nanda. Thank you so much. Now I would like to request Dr. Anita Garg Mangla to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Devanshi. Uh, good evening, Thank one you. and all present. On behalf of Women's Development Cell GRC, I, Dr. Anita Garg Mangla, extend my heartfelt gratitude to the speaker of the second day, Dr. Santuna Kar, for accepting our invite to be the esteemed speaker for this international webinar series and apprising us with a very insightful, touching session with her personal journey shared. Thank you so very much. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Sarita Nanda for critical sharing of her views about the talk and Dr. Vijay Lakshmi K. Gupta, guest of honor, for sparing her valuable time to grace the occasion with her kind presence. I will again fall short in words to thank our respected principal ma'am for her motivation unrelenting, unconditional support and guidance from the inception of the thought to the culmination of this second year day event. Ma'am, it's your faith in us which inspires us to do more and reach new heights. Thank you for being there for WDC always. And special thanks to all the guests, faculty and students for their presence and making today's webinar a great success. Looking forward to meeting all of you with the same enthusiasm tomorrow as well. See you all tomorrow. Till then, take care and be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye, Santuna. All the best. All the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone. Lots of love to all of you. Bye-bye. 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 I, I would like to add one line here that, of course, it's an official, official thanks. So I have to say accepting invite. But the fact is that I just made a call to Anu, Santana, and Vaishali and told them they're supposed to speak on this, this day. So actually, I didn't go for any formality. I said I want them to speak and just told them that time and date. And they said, all right. So this is how they are. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much.